Hello everyone. Now we will understand what type of policies can be designed by the government in order to facilitate knowledge transfers from university to industries, including the policies related to patenting and licensing. Here you can see that broadly talking about this transfer in order to facilitate such transfers, either policies could be designed to encourage the formation of the regional economic clusters and spin-off which will be based on university research. And the policies which would be effectively trying to stimulate the university patenting and licensing activity. We will take these two one by one. So first when we talk about universities and the idea of the cluster development in order to maybe have spin-offs, startups located within a particular zone or in region, what we are looking forward is uh, the relationship between the university and regional development. Now this discussion is effectively motivated by the re high technology regional clusters that we have seen in the US. For instance, Silicon Valley in California, Route 128 in the Boston area. So what we have seen there are basically agglomeration of the new firms and the major research universities. Research universities like University of California, Berkeley, Stanford, University of um, San Francisco, Boston, Harvard University and MI, so MIT. So these institutions are located in a certain area where there is also an agglomeration of the new firms and these new firms are focusing on a specific uh, domain or, of knowledge where they are coming up with the newer ideas which are then translated into the products which reach out to the masses and that is where you see a thriving uh, ecosystem for the startups. So these kind of uh, developments has in fact motivated the creation of the science park also. In terms of theoretical uh, you know, understanding of this phenomenon, we can understand it as a localization phenomena. What do we mean by that? If it correctly means that there are knowledge spillovers within the US. A study by Jaffe and co-authors have found that these knowledge spillovers are measured by the location of inventors who are now cited university patents located in the regional, in the same region. So what you have, you want to understand whether the knowledge spillovers occur between the university and the firms or not. So what you look at are the patents which are being filed by the different inventors and whether these inventors are now citing, backward uh, citation is the focus here, so citing the patents which are being held by the university. If that is the case, then being localized or being located within that certain region essentially means that these inventors are actually learning from the knowledge that is being created by the universities. Then you can also look at the patent filed by US inventor. They are disproportionately you know, citing the scientific papers from research institutions and this result comes from Hick et al. Once again highlighting the major source of information for the firms being the university research. Now here when we are talking about this knowledge accumulation or uh, you know localization within a certain region, what are the possible reasons for that? So the question that we are trying to understand, the answer to the question which we are trying to understand is to why agglomerate? Why is it that certain firms, certain startups along with certain in, uh, institutions be it academic or research they tend to be located within a certain geography. There if you recall our discussion on innovative firm in the context of British district the idea is very much similar. Like Marshall pointed out that the mysteries of the trade were in the air. Here also you will find the same kind of an informal exchanges that happen between the personnel who are now involved in the either the universities or in the firms or maybe the research institutions. Also you find that the labor which is required in order to support the activities of the firm tend to be concentrated, located within that particular region. If you want to do something really bright in the IT sector and you have a very brilliant idea, it is possible that you would look forward to going to Bangalore and be able to now commercialize it. So similarly, the skilled input which may be required for the particular industry that might be also concentrated. Apart from that, the agglomeration may also facilitate the infrastructure which can now be developed that is specialized to the need and the requirements of that particular, uh, you know, specific domain in which those firms, etc. are located. So this kind of you know, concentration of the inputs, infrastructure, informal exchanges essentially means that there are knowledge spillover. There is a lot more to learn.
then that can be simply documented. If that is the case, clearly agglomeration supports the activities, whether it is the firms or the academic institutions. So then what we have seen that the cases like that of America have also now been emulated or also imitated in other countries. For instance, there are examples of such science cities in Japan, scientific breakthrough, breakthroughs, in ex, uh, examples of specification of the molecular structure of superconducting material in the science city in Japan, which also have uh, private uh, and public partnership projects, including that of earthquake safety, environmental degradation, studies of roadways, fermentation science, microbiology, etc. In Singapore, we have seen that National uh, University of Singapore and Biopolis has in fact a biomedical sciences cluster. Similarly, in South Korea, there is a cluster. Similar advancements and similar activities are also noted in the innovation hubs which are near the Peking University in Beijing, research park at IIT Madras and similar research innovation park which is now established at IIT Delhi. Similarly in Taiwan, there is a semi in the semiconductor sector you also find a science park. So in the Asian context also, now you find that there are developments which are supporting the creation of these kind of uh, clusters. Now, when we talk about these clusters and uh, how they are being developed over a period of a time, whether they actually contribute to the development of the region, the studies are also, uh, you know, a bit critical in the sense that there is a little evidence that you find that exists that university caused the development of the region high technology agglomeration. In fact, when we will look, what we will do today is we will look at the specific case study of a Bangalore and the club uh, from uh, Professor Rakesh Basan's work uh, titled Bangalore Cluster Evolution Growth and Challenges which is a working paper of Indian Institute of Management uh, Ahmedabad. So there you will see that that it is not something which happens with a one policy that is being done by the government but rather a series of actions that take place. So what uh, these studies have highlighted that it may not be the causality, it may not be the main reason, the presence of the university itself may not be the main reason that the development of those regional uh, high technology agglomerations happen. It may be one of the factors that has contributed to such developments. Lesser evidence also support the argument that the regional or the innovation policies of the government are effective in creating agglomeration. If indeed that was the case, then most of the governments would have designed policies in order to support this kind of a development of the cluster. However, these clusters may have, the policies may play a significant role, but as I said earlier, various other factors also come together in order to ensure the development and the thriving whether they will be able to sustain, survive over a long period of a time will also be important. Then there are historical reasons which has been pointed in the studies who talk about that Silicon Valley's area as a history as a center for the new form formation and the innovation date back to the 20th century. So what we are looking at, these agglomerations, this uh, you know, coming together or this cluster development, it has a contingency, it has a path dependence and it has a supporting policy. So that means there are, uh, you know, development of the cluster is contingent upon whether the different policies has been there to support or not whether what we have found is that there is uh, there are supporting institutions there or not what about the government policies what about the path dependence over a period of a time is it that there is certain level of knowledge which was already pre-existing in that particular space now we will try and understand all of these, as I said uh, earlier, through the development of the Bangalore cluster. Now, in this paper, what Professor Basant has done is try to apply the innovation system concept to a cluster. Effectively, that would require, if you want to do that, that would require an analysis of the capabilities which are internal within the cluster as such and how now they are linked to the external parties.
so what uh, first let us look at the developments how it has come into picture what policies over a period of a time has been changed introduced that has now led to the creation and then we will come back to this point of if we want to understand the cluster development in the national innovation system framework how we will be we will be looking at the linkages internal to this cluster and the linkages of the the various actors within the cluster to the external parties so first of all one has to understand that there was already a bit of an uh, you know industrial activity going on in this region even before independence there were large public sector investment that happened by the government immediately after invest, uh, independence also for example in uh, hmt bel bhel hal in 1940 and iti at that time you also realize that the license was given to the private companies as well as like companies like motor industries company which was a subsidiary of robert bosch a german company and machine tool manufacturer pedia so you find that the farm level activities the investments that has been required are already taking place in this particular space as such so then the emergence of this city as a center for information technology one can argue that it actually comes from the decisions which were taken by the federal government immediately after the independence also so what we as i said earlier some companies were already existing before the independence and others were then by being uh, supported post independence so then with this background where you already have the presence of certain company and the presence of the company was further supported after the independence what you find is that that in during the 1970s there was a certain uh, developments which further supported these activities for example the software export scheme it was launched as early as in, in 1972 that means the government and the state was ready to identify the potential of software export as a major export of the country not only that the scheme provided a variety of concessions to software exporters including hardware import and at a very low tariff moreover computer and software education and training was emphasized and institution that focused on training were allowed to import hardware at a much lower import duties around the same time what you find department of electronics began to encourage public sector products in this particular uh, area as well and with the software development apart from that public procurement of software it was also given to the indian company so a priority was given to the indian industry and that tried to, that started to begin to create a domestic demand for the software as such then there was this foreign exchange regulation act and uh, in fact this particular act was you can see that it reduced the ownership of the firms in india and computer firms were no exception particularly the foreign ownership of the companies were reduced as per this particular act that means uh, effectively what will happen that some of the foreign companies will now no longer be interested in continuing in the country because they will not be able to have a majority ownership of this particular companies in the country so what happened as a fallout of this particular government decision was to reduce this of foreign ownership in fact led that uh, to a software development it started building in house how did that happen so some companies like icl from uk they accepted this they reduced their share and uh, equity uh, to 40% while others for example like that of an ibm they left the country in 1978 now when ibm left uh it led to uh when the departure of the ibm from the country actually led to a significant implication for the computer industry what was that so some companies they created 8 bit microprocessor and sold them in the local industry and one of them was a wipe uh, wipro based in bangalore so an estimated 1200 software personnel were released into the indian market due to the exit of ibm and according to an earlier study by hicks what was pointed out that it has an impact a very important impact on the software exports why because many of these people have now to find an option to sustain in the indian market so what would they do they would pursuing their careers in it and they would developing their own software companies with the which was providing software services and many of these companies were set up in bangalore because the focus of many of these it uh, companies setting up during this period was actually to provide 
provide service to the domestic industry and uh, over a period of a time they started looking for the export market so this release of the personnel who has now been trained and has got an international exposure in terms of their tri trading with respect to what it is been doing clearly had a very significant impact on the creation of the new companies within this particular area then there was also a trade liberalization in 1970s with respect to computer hardware they were liberalized that hardware imports were liberalized one has to understand when we are talking about 70s in the indian context from the indian industry there is a lot more uh, regulated environment in which the companies has to now operate and uh how does does the liberalization or opening up of the market for particular sector becomes very uh, significant development in the sense that the, the government would have thought through it they would have realized why they need to do it and as a result they have been able to take a step which is a bit divergent from their overall policy as such so then this uh, kind of a liberalization of the hardware imports and especially for software exporters and then giving them a variety of incentive to export were essentially put in place in the second half of the 1970 but we do see that in 1980s uh, the the 1970s we do see that that the controls came back they were put on the computer hardware that means hardware import was now being rather regulated and there were very strict controls on that and import duties were raised on them so besides software export could also uh, you know uh, apart from that the software exporters which are now engaged in exporting the software they could also loan the computers that was another facility which was being uh, created and um, the idea there was to support their your software creation activities at that time department of electronics approach to the domestic software industry became more supportive than the earlier restrictive and regulatory one and it also encouraged software exports and export oriented foreign investment so the policy was to basically uh, protect the hardware industry had an important impact on the software industry now what was that it in fact for, uh, forced the indian companies now or com indian computer firms to uh, shift their focus from the mainframe and which was a mainstay of the multinationals at that point of our time towards the production of the uh, you know uh, on using micro and personal computers now this led to a generation of the software engineers now who has gained a great deal of uh, experience in programming pcs uh, and and operating systems like ms dos and particularly unix which was the operating system for the non ibm so this particular operating system was then preferred and pushed by cmc and doe policy changes in 1986 further supported the import of 1400 unix system which was shipped in in 1987 88 compared to only 480 a year ago so this is according to an idc uh, study so meanwhile the pcs has come to in india and within a couple of years what we find there was a kind of a price war uh, which was triggered by sterling computer it led to the vendors slashing the prices by 1918 there were more than 70000 micro computers in the market the pcs and compatible market uh, you know boomed alongside the local software package grew by december 1988 what we find is that 500 software companies were making software package so this is the uh, you can say so these are the developments which we are till up the 1980 now apart from that there were major uh, developments in the private sector also so what were those uh, developments for example companies like hcl vipro they became the first company in the world to build computer based on unix developing on the uh, or building on the developments that happened in the uh, in terms of the regulation like we said earlier and apart from that the computer policy came in 1984 what it did it actually identified it as an industry so that means over a period of a time now there is a potential to uh, create uh, maybe uh, tax credit schemes or give exemptions to the particular industry the measures were also created to facilitate impure imports and also reduce the tax burden as such so what you find is a new software policy for the liberalize the regime that advocated import it was this regime now which allowed the entry of texas instrument in the 
industry and Texas in, uh, instrument in Bangalore in 18, uh, 1985 86 it was 100% export oriented foreign owned and operated subsidiary now uh, once again like I said earlier the, the regime that we are talking about is extremely restrictive and opening up it for a select case would definitely would be a very major steps ahead so uh, according to uh, Professor Basant he has quoted a study by Higgs which points out that the DOE and the government of India at that point of a time was very quick in processing the files related to the licensing and uh, also uh, you know with respect to accommodating the TI in the country. In fact, it uh, DOE seems to have broken around 26 separate rules to accommodate the Bangalore subsidiary of te uh, Texas uh, instruments. And it in fact was willing, willing to do more. Why? Because Italia is now going to play a very important role in the development and the growth of this particular cluster as such. So then apart from that, we know that the establishment of IITs in the 60s, it led to creation of a specific kind of a skill in the country. They were graduating from IITs and they were during 70s and 80s, they emigrated. And in the 1990s, what happened, what we find that many of these Indian trained engineers were in fact running more than 775 technology companies in California, Silicon Valley. Apart from that, what so what, what is the final outcome? So if you look in terms of the national innovation system, on one hand, we have seen the specific role which has been played by the government in terms of devising the specific policies to support, to facilitate, to incentivize the software export. Then we have seen a emergence of the private sector, which is also once again in a very unintended way being supported through the exit of I IBM. Then the when we enter into 1990s, what happens is that the market in India began to open up. So we started deregulating, we started de-licensing, we started globalizing and as the result the restrictions which were put on foreign companies they began to uh, reduce and as a result the diaspora which is now being present in the foreign countries they also have an access to the Indian market they may want to come back and they started contributing to this entire thriving growing ecosystem as such. So apart from that, in, in a way we find that the multinationals has also played a very significant role whether it is Microsoft, Google, Motorola, Intel, IBM in terms of developing the Bangalore's R&D landscape. And then they also started having a kind of a developments linkages with the small and um, uh, firms and, and that is the MNCs begin to have uh, a linkages with the small firms as such. So then if you look at this so-called Silicon Valley of India which we are talking about now, in fact before independence also it was a British military, military base and uh, Dr. Vishweshwarya set up the engineering college in 1917 and that led to the creation of Mysore University over a period of a time. Indian Institute of Sciences was established as early in 1911. So that means in that particular space educational institutions were already developing. They were there, they were setting up and as a result the Bangalore, uh, the, the area, the domain, the space itself is fueled with the labor space, with the labor force which is highly educated, skilled who is capable of dealing with the specific high technology sector which is now going to come there and thrive as such. So then the cycle come back comes complete even if in terms of the role of the government, the presence of the institutions, policies which come from the government and the presence of the firms which include your both domestic as well as your foreign companies. So now let us, so this is a brief overview of the discussion that happens in Professor Basan paper. I will, uh, you know, encourage you to please get access to this paper and read that entire story of the development of the Silicon Valley of India as such. So now coming back to the first point which we talked about initially that if we want to understand this kind of a cluster development in the framework of national innovation system, what we have to capture? We have to capture the intra-form sources intra-cluster sources and the sources of information that occurs outside the 
knowledge. These are the one which has also been referred by Professor Lukwinder Singh in his work when, for example, intraform sources are based on learning by doing. Passive experience of production can be a very important significant source through which the companies will learn. Improved process and practices derived from the trial and error experimentation, adaptation and improvement of existing technology, that means reverse engineering. Intra cluster basically there is a linkage knowledge spillovers between the producers, knowledge spillovers that may happen between the producers of the machinery and the user of the machinery and the related links, the mobility of the labor from one sector to the another, training and skill development through the cluster based or mediated uh, initiatives, link that may emerge between enterprises and cluster based technology institutions, collaboration that happens between the cluster based enterprises for adaptation and technology development for example machinery, product design etc. link between enterprises and customer located within the cluster. So these are the various channels of the sources through which the knowledge now flows within the cluster development within the industrial cluster as such. However, it is very important to understand that the information which we are talking about is now not going to be limited or uh, the sources of which are now go not going to be limited within the particular cluster. It is very important that the company should be able to access the information which is outside the cluster. And where will that information come from? That information comes from the customers, the traders knowledge, machinery and other input suppliers, collaboration, testing, technology development, developing uh, linkages with the technology institutions, enterprises outside the cluster. Externally source training, that means you are sending the personnel of your own company to outsiders to get trained and visit to outside clusters, firms, etc.